Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Scott McGilvery. This is The Real Estate Rebel. Today, we are talking about one of the most frequently asked questions that I get, um, and I'm happy to answer it. Here's what today's topic is. What is the fastest way to grow a real estate portfolio? Everybody wants to know, how can I do this quickly? How can I get many, many properties generating a passive income for me so that I can retire early or quit my job or just make lots of money? It's a valid question. It's a great question. And today I'm going to answer it. As I said, welcome to the show. Don't forget to like, subscribe, or follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Um, today's episode, we are going to be getting into the deep strategy of becoming a wealthy real estate investor. Now, before I get into the entire method of how to grow a portfolio quickly, I think it's important to make a distinction between growing a real estate portfolio quickly and getting rich quickly. They are two very different things. Growing your portfolio quickly is about securing yourself for long-term wealth. If you do it too slow, you're del just delaying the opportunity to become wealthy. Um, if you try to pull out too many profits too quickly, you're gonna jeopardize the entire plan. Um, and what's really cool about the strategies that I'm gonna show you today, that I'm gonna talk about today, is that once you do get good at this, once you become an intermediate or an advanced investor, I'm gonna share with you the, the tool, the single most powerful tool that I have, that I use for absolutely every deal that I do. And it is imperative that if you wanna become a real estate mogul, that you will need to be able to do this as well. So I'll share that at the end. But um, let's start at the beginning. I mean, how did I, how did I get to this, this process and how did we figure this out? Well. You know, I don't think it's any secret that I am a huge fan of the buy and hold method. There's all kinds of different ways to make money in real estate. Some of them are quick strategies. Some of them are, you know, um, sort of wholesaler strategies and other are long-term wealth strategies. And me personally, even though I've tried a little bit of everything, I have found that my comfort zone and my specialty is in the long-term wealth space. And what I love about real estate is that you don't have to come from a family of real estate investors. You don't need you know, a four-year degree in real estate. You need, to, uh, you need to be taught the things that they don't teach you in our education system. There's nothing in our curriculum that teaches you how to be a real estate investor. You need to learn these from people who are already doing it. And since I learned through a lot of trial and error, my goal here is to sum up years of experience into 40 minutes or less so that you can start going down this path sooner rather than later without making some of the same mistakes that I did. Because when people ask me what my biggest regret is in real estate, I always say, I wish I had bought more properties sooner, even though on, you know, looking back, I did buy a lot of properties, but it took me five years to really gain the momentum and the knowledge to be able to start buying multiples and multiples and multiples at a time. The first few years, the first almost three years of real estate investing, I was only able to get three properties. That was about one a year. Um, now, knowing what I know and what I'm gonna share today, um, the amount of properties you buy every year could be virtually limitless if you are effective using this strategy. So the foundation of a buy and hold uh, successful long-term wealth building strategy is understanding the foundation of how to acquire properties, how to analyze properties, how to fix up properties, how to rent properties, and then how to refinance or pull the equity out and do it again. That is the kind of Cole's notes of the whole thing, and I'm gonna get into it. Some people call this buy and hold. I've been calling it flip to yourself for years because people understand the concept of, of flipping, I put a little twist on it and I said, instead of flipping a house to someone else, why don't you just flip it back to yourself? And I'll tell you why that's so important. I'll explain that. Um, there's also the Burr method, uh, the, the buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. Um, I'll do it. I have another podcast that I'm going to do diving deep into my own version of Burr, but 
what all of these things taught, like no matter which method you call it, no matter which variation of this you're focused on, it's really understanding how to acquire those properties. And that's what you'll understand by the end of this. You'll understand how do I buy lots of properties without having to use my own money? That's what's critical here because most people will run out of their own money. And even better is how do I stop even having to use JV partners or other people's money? Because other people's money is a great strategy when you're building, but eventually you should have enough momentum to finance the properties through your own means. It's still technically other people's money, but you can retain all the control. So let's go back to the beginning. When you're looking to invest in real estate, the absolute best properties are the ones that you can buy at or below market value. So you have to understand how to analyze a property or have a property appraised. A lot of people think that go online, they look at listing prices and they think that's what properties are worth, what other properties are listed for around it. Wrong. That's what amateurs do. No professionals in real estate use listing price as a metric. We use sold price. Sold price, or you can use cap rates if you're getting into um, institutional properties or commercial properties. But let's start with appraised value. That is, what is your property worth based on recently sold properties in the area? Because you don't wanna be buying a property above its appraised value, because now you're fighting an uphill battle in order to try to build equity into the property, which is the final goal of the flip to yourself method. I'm gonna call this flip to yourself because it's the most accurate explanation of how this works. So when you're looking at properties, you see you find a property, it's a duplex maybe, and it's got those two units and they want $300,000 for the property. What you def your first piece of homework is to find out what recently sold duplexes in that area are selling for. And if they're selling for $300,000, to 350,000, you know that that's a fair price to pay. If they're selling for $250,000, that's where your offer should be. Your offer, doesn't matter what list price is, your offer should be at or below appraised value. If you have to pay above appraised value, you're not gonna be able to do this method successfully because you're gonna be fighting the uphill battle of overpaying for a property. So just like when you wanna flip a property, it's not complicated math, you wanna buy it, and then once you've purchased it at a proper value, you need to know what its after repair value is, which is called its ARV. The only reason to buy a property at its current value or less is if you know that after fixing it up, it's gonna be worth more than the purchase price plus the cost of renovation. So if you pay 300,000 for a property and you have to put $50,000 of work into it, you better know that recently sold fixed up versions of the property you're buying are selling for more than $350,000. It sounds complicated, but it's really not. You wanna know what it's worth in its current condition, and then you're trying to figure out what it's worth in its fixed up version. And as long as you can buy it and fix it up for less than what it's gonna be worth when you're done, you are going to be able to pull some equity out of this property. Now, it doesn't happen instantly, it can. It can happen pretty quick. I've done this in as short as two months, um, and sometimes I might wait two years in order to pull that equity out. But the critical aspect of this is the ability to build value. So when you look at a property, you should be thinking about two things. If I were to flip it, would there be a proper uh, profit? Yes, great. The second question you need to ask yourself is, if I bought it and fixed it up to flip it, and I couldn't sell it and I rented it, would there be cash flow? And if the answer is yes, you've got a great opportunity in front of you. These are my favorite types of properties and pretty much exclusively what I purchase at this time. I like to buy properties that need some work, that I know are gonna be worth more money when I finish doing that work, that I know I can rent out and cover all of my costs and still make a profit because that leads me to the next step. Now an amateur would typically buy a property, fix it up, and then put it on the market, try to sell it, and um, recognize that profit, and that would be considered flipping, which I get it. Flipping is, flipping is exciting. 
And it's very tempting to want to sell a property after you've fixed it up and you know it's worth more money. Heck, I know a lot of people that are tempted to sell their own primary residences because they go up in value. So I get it. People like flipping properties, but flipping properties is not efficient. This is the part of my story that is about learning from other people's mistakes. And I'll tell you one of mine. When I look back at properties I was buying 16, 18, even 20 years ago, um, I started flipping properties for a while and I thought I was doing a great job. Um, I was buying properties, putting a little bit of work into them, putting them back on the market, selling them and making, you know, sometimes a $50,000 gross profit on those properties. But what I started to realize as I was flipping all these properties is, okay, it's, it's selling for $50,000 more than what I bought it for plus the cost of the renovations. But then when I was closing on the properties, I realized, boy, there's a lot of closing fees here. And I was using a real estate agent because that's the fastest way to sell it. So I'm paying a realtor a huge commission. And then I was had trying to factor in all of the holding costs. I'm like, wow, I was paying all the utilities. I had to pay the taxes. You know, I was paying insurance during that time. All of a sudden, what felt like a $50,000 profit margin truly turned out to be about fifteen dollars to $20,000, which is still great. Making fifteen dollars to $20,000 in two to three months on a property, that's great. You can make a living like that but it's not the most effective way. I realized I was giving away more of the profits than I was keeping. And then, and then I started to recognize that, wait a second, the properties that I had bought and, rent, and renovated and rented out and kept, as those mortgages were coming up for renewal a year, two years later, I was having this opportunity to refinance them at their new value and that $50,000 in gross profit, I had access to all of that in the form of a loan and I didn't have to pay a commission. I didn't have to pay any closing costs. Um, all my carrying costs were being covered through the rental income and all of a sudden I had access to $50,000 versus $15,000. And the real magic here, I haven't even got to the most interesting part, is when you flip a property, that $15,000 profit, you have to pay taxes on it. <laughs> So if you end up paying, you know, $5,000 in taxes, you're left with 10 grand. Your buying power for your next property is only increased by 10 grand. When I do a flip to myself, which is basically getting a new loan to buy out the old loan, I now have access to $50,000. I have, I've mitigated or deferred any uh, expenses because I'm not actually reclosing on the property. It's still in my name or in my company's name. I have no commissions to pay, which is fantastic. And believe it or not, I don't owe any taxes on that equity that I pulled out because a transaction hasn't occurred. Taxes are owed when a transaction occurs. And when you sell a property or flip a property, you're creating a transaction. When you are refinancing a property that is not considered a transaction, you are basically buying the property from yourself. That's why I call it flip to yourself the best person in that you know to continue to own this property, which is rented out and cash flowing is you. So why would you give it to someone else? It really starts to make sense when you think about it that way. So now what you can do because your buying power is $50,000 versus $10,000, you can maybe have two down payments. So you see how all of a sudden by keeping properties, you can actually grow a portfolio faster than if you sell them. And that is, that is the secret that nobody's telling you. This is the caramel secret to real estate investing. And once you've decoded it, it is your most powerful tool. So let me explain how this works in a little more detail. Typically, if I'm going to do this intentionally, I know I want to do this, I'm looking to buy the property using a short-term loan, something that doesn't have a penalty for me to break it or that is super flexible. Now, typically you'll pay a couple bips more than a long-term uh, secured or um, closed uh, financing tool. So you might pay you know, 50 basis points more than your regular loan, but that's okay because 
it gives you the flexibility and it eliminates penalties. What I see a lot of investors do is they make this huge mistake. One of the biggest mistake first time investors do is they find a way to buy one property, usually using equity out of their own home in order to come up with a down payment. They get excited for the lowest interest rate possible. So they lock into a three or a five or a long term mortgage. And then once they have the property, it's cash flowing, they want to get another one. And they're like, now how do I get my second one? And the answer is you screwed up. You got yourself into a long-term mortgage and it's in that first property that you bought that the down payment for your second property is locked up. And in order to get it, you may have to pay tens of thousands of dollars in penalties, which defeats the purpose of doing this in the first place. So if we can set you up to buy properties correctly from the beginning, it should get easier to buy more properties, not necessarily more difficult. So let's talk about what happens once you've secured a property, you have a short term uh, loan in order to do so. You may actually need to use a second source of financing to do the renovations, which is totally fine. It's completely possible. Um, in fact, what I'm going to tell you is probably going to blow your mind at the end of this. I am going to show you how I fully finance all of my deals. Now, a lot of people don't think that this is possible. They don't think that exists. But when I buy a $500,000 property, I use a $500,000 loan to do it. The whole thing. And so once I show you how to do that, the sky's the limit. But let's get there one step at a time because you actually need to acquire and do a few of these properties in order to be able to use that tool. So here we go. You've got a property. You've used a short-term loan in order to uh, secure the financing. And now you need to renovate it, usually using a second loan, like a construction loan, perhaps, unless you have the funds. You know, If you got the cash to do this, you can fast forward through a few of these steps which is nice, but not always the case. Sometimes you'll use a JV partner uh, or private capital in order to do this as well. But because it's such a short period of time that you are buying and renovating, um, typically a higher interest rate isn't gonna have a huge impact on your profitability. Because here's what you're going to do. Once you've bought it and you've renovated it and you've got it rented out, you are now in a position to look at a new financing structure because you have a fixed up cash flowing property that should be appraised for more than what you bought it for plus the work that you put into it. So here's where the third loan comes into place. This can be a refi of the original loan. It can be a brand new loan to buy out the, uh, the debt that you have on the property. But this is where you want to finance your property at its fullest value so that you can pull equity out. Now, some people call this recycling your down payment. Um, I call this flip to yourself. Once that new loan is in place, it should give you access to more credit, which you use in turn to buy your next property. Now, if you do it right, you continue to grow that uh, base amount, which means eventually from your first property, you might be able to buy two properties. From those two properties, you might be able to buy three. From those three, you can buy five. You know, it's almost exponential how quickly you can grow. And believe you me, it works because I've done it and I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of other investors do this as well. And we're not making it up. Flip to yourself is not a made up method. It is, <laughs> it is the real estate investors, the average everyday real estate investors tool that is a copycat from what the institutional investors are doing. Right When I buy an apartment building with 24 units, I'll typically do some work to fix them up, increase the rents, refinance it based on its cap rate, new ca its cap rate, which is dictating, I mean, a cap rate is a whole other story here, but basically what I'm looking at is its value is based on a cap rate, which is based on the amount of income coming in. And if I bought this building and now I've made it worth millions of dollars more, I can pull equity out and have access to that. So this is something that institutional investors do all the time. It is an absolute necessary piece of the puzzle for institutional investors. And we've dialed it back and now I'm showing people how to do it at an individual level. 
And you can call that flip to yourself. You can call that burr. You can really call it whatever you want. But as long as you're getting the equity out in order to buy more properties, you are using the most effective strategy for growing a portfolio quickly. And I always say if you, you know, if you want to get, if you want to be wealthy, look at what wealthy people do. Wealthy people know how to access pre-tax profits in order to grow their businesses. You know, even with registered funds, you know, some of us have registered savings plans or we have retirement plans which have tax incentives to them. We're basically just deferring taxes, right? This is the same idea. You're deferring a tax implication, but the real magic is you're accessing the capital now. You're not waiting until retirement to access that capital, which gives you so much more control over how quickly you can grow because putting it into more real estate means growing quicker, quicker means accessing more of that capital. Now, obviously we don't wanna do this by guessing. So I'm going to recommend that if you haven't already downloaded a deal analyzer of some sort or a deal calculator, that you go into the app store, app store and find one. Uh, right now I'm using Real Smart Deal. It does the Burr method, it does the flip to yourself, it has the buy, to your, buy and hold. Um, it also has the flip. What's great about these deal analyzers is that there's free versions of them that give you access to almost as almost all the information you need. If you want to get real sophisticated, you can pay you know five, ten bucks a month. But real smart deal in the app store, you can start putting all the numbers in there, and you can actually project out how much money you're going to have access to if everything lines up. You put your renovation costs in, your purchase price, your after repair value, your rental income, and it shows you that even after you refinance the property after it's been renovated, you're still cash flowing and you have more money to buy more properties. So I recommend open up your phone, your tablet, whatever it might be, download a, uh, a deal analyzer. Every investor uses them. And the real smart deal is a pretty, uh, pretty good one. So go get it. Now, ooh, I love this. I love this. So now that you understand how this works, what is critical is, is identifying the appropriate properties to do this with, because not every property will work. So I'm gonna make a recommendation here that you start looking at certain types of investment properties in order to make this happen. Typically, single family homes are not the best place to do the flip to yourself method. What you wanna look at are student rentals, and I'll tell you very quickly how I've done this with student rentals. When I was in my early 20s, I started buying student rentals in the fall, like late fall, like November, December. And what I would do is I would actually buy a, a single family home. I would convert it to a student rental by, you know, changing a rec room to a bedroom in a basement. Um, maybe just, just converting an, another office into a bedroom, going from maybe two to three bedrooms up to four bedrooms, and then calling it a student rental. So little bit of renovation, buying it at the right time, which was in the fall when not, not a lot of people are buying. And then uh, in the spring when it was rented out and the demand for student rentals was high and parents of students in these university towns were coming in and trying to buy up similar properties, the values would start to shoot up. And typically I could pull 20 to $30,000 out of these properties in less than six months worth of time. It worked extremely well. So this works with student rentals. It works even better with multi-units, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, anything that's got more than one unit in it. Typically this works extremely well. Um, and again, maybe the way you've added value is that you put that second unit in or you added that basement apartment, right? You aren't, you're not buying it turnkey. You're buying something that needs work. Uh, vacation rental properties kind of work. They're, those are better cash flowing assets, but um, those aren't typically the flip to yourself assets that I would be looking at. Um, and then honestly, anything that's got more than two levels to it typically works well as well. And what I mean by that are side splits, back splits, Victorians that are two and a half stories. I typically find with those properties, Having more finished floor space equals more profitability, 
because a lot of them are appraised based on finished square footage. So just an idea of where to start looking if you want to do this. Oh, now let me tell you something that should get you really excited. What is the tool that I am using to fully finance my real estate deals? And this isn't necessarily something you're going to be able to do right off the bat. But once you have five or six properties, you absolutely need to start thinking about a blanket loan or a credit facility secured against the equity in all your properties. This is the absolute tipping point in real estate between the struggling investor and the investor who is crushing it. Once you have this facility in place, you can almost buy any property you want despite financing issues. So what I did, and this I probably did this about 10 years ago after I had a whole bunch of properties over here, over here, over here, over here, and I was trying to track a refi over there, mortgages all over the place. It, it becomes really hard to track all of your properties and what's going on. Um, you know, I've got things renewing every month, two or three deals renewing. And so I talked to somebody at the bank and I said, what I would really like to do is to put all my properties together because most of them are in my company anyway. And instead of having an individual line of credit or mortgage on each one, what if we just look at all the equity across the whole board and put one credit facility in place for 80% loan to value on all the equity? What would that look like? And they're like, oh yeah, we do that all the time. I was like, what? How come nobody told me about this? Best thing I ever did. You know, $50,000 of equity here, $150,000 of equity here, $200,000 of equity here, another $80,000 of equity here. Started adding it all up. And all of a sudden you've got a million dollar revolving line of credit. And this is something that because it's not called a mortgage, uh, it's not a mortgage, it's a blanket loan or a revolving line of credit, you don't fall under the same mortgage rules and restrictions that are out there when you're typically buying one property at a time. And since you can draw on it at any time and you only pay interest when you draw on it, it's sitting there ready to go. This is why when you're competing on, a, on an offer, you're trying to purchase a property, I can typically win in a, in a bidding war or in an offer situation because I'll come in and I can waive the financing. I don't need to go and get approved for financing because I already have the line of credit sitting there ready to go. And if I'm buying a $500,000 property, I'll draw $500,000 to buy the property. Fully financed. Fully financed without having to start a new loan, pay any fees, go through an approval process. I'm not approving personally anymore. My portfolio is, a, is approving for, the, for the, um, the line, which is great because you can only be approved for so long personally. They're not looking at my uh, income statements anymore. They're not pulling my credit. I don't have to worry about the things that typically a novice investor would have to do. And this is where you want to get to. You want to get to the point where you can sit down with somebody and say, hey, I've managed to acquire three, five, six properties. And now I want to do a little bit more of a sophisticated approach to investing. What type of products can you set up that will give me access to a line of credit when I need it? So these facilities are critical. And again, these are not something that you see advertised at financial institutions. Um, this isn't something that typically you're taught even in a personal finance course. I mean, you may learn a bit, a bit about credit cards. You may even have be fortunate enough to understand how a mortgage works. Um, but these are the real secret weapons when it comes to being a successful real estate investor. Um, and that is probably the ultimate way to use other people's money in order to acquire more properties. So think about this long term. If you're the type of person who wants to build legacy wealth for your family, if you're the type of person who wants to have good cash flow in retirement, if you know maybe what you're doing now for a career isn't giving you satisfaction and you have a little more energy and maybe skills than are being used, then I would really suggest taking a deeper look at the opportunity 
to build a cash flowing portfolio of real estate using the fastest method possible to do it. It's obviously going to take a little more work to fully flush this out, but today really was about giving you the 30,000 foot view and pulling back the curtain and saying, here's what real estate investing looks like. Here's the secret weapon that makes it happen. The question is, are you ready to take the next steps to do that? That is up to you. There are a ton of resources on my website, scottmcgillery.com. You can go to the Real Estate Rebel Facebook group, put your questions in there. If you're having problems finding the right people to help you do this, put your questions up there. We'll try to direct you to the right place. You can always come back. We're going to revisit this idea. It's too big of an idea for just one podcast. So I'm going to bring in some more guests to give you some of their uh, different angles on how this works. Um, but listen, like, subscribe, follow us. You turn your notifications on. Uh, we're going to have more of this to come. So if you like what you're hearing, if you're the type of person that wants to do this full time, we're going to have to talk again. I'm Scott McGilvery, and this has been The Real Estate Rebel.